and I will email that link to your registered emails. So my name is Helen Georgiou. I'm a lecturer in science education at the University of Wollongong. And it really is a pleasure to welcome everyone here today. Um, you've come from all over. So we've got South Africa and Europe and, and North America. And I'm really glad that um, everyone can, can make it. I'm speaking from Sydney, Australia. So I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'm welcoming everyone today on behalf of Shuri the Centre for Higher Education Research Impact and Innovation, a research centre here at the University of Wollongong. Shuri was conceived out of a desire to support high quality research in higher education. Um, to this end, Shuri has been facilitating meetings which bring together communities. So recognising the power in collaboration and in that sharing of expertise. In this seminar series, uh, we're hoping to bring people together to consider how theory can be used in higher education research to inspire change. You'll see the details of the second seminar in this series on the slide here, um, and that will focus on the theory of practice architectures, but today we will be discussing legitimation code theory. Together with myself, we'll be joined by Professor Carl Mayton and Associate Professor Lee Rosniak. Um, Lee works at the University of Witzwater, Witzwater's Rand in South Africa in teacher education, and Carl is the director of the LCT Centre for Knowledge Building at the University of Sydney. So I'm really grateful for uh, both of you for being able to come to um, speak for us today. Um, Kyle, Carl will be um, introducing the talks. So um, I'll hand over Carl to you now. Thanks, Helen. Um, let's close the chat and I need to ah, do this thing that you need to stop screen share. Yes. Thank you. And my screen share. So hopefully you can see that fine. So thanks, uh, Helen, and uh, thanks to the Centre for Higher Education Research Innovation and Impact for inviting us to talk today. As Helen said, we're going to discuss Legitimation Code Theory, or LCT. Um, so I'll introduce LCT. I'll discuss what kind of framework it is. And how it's used and I'll focus on one part of LCT called semantics and then Helen and then Lee will discuss how those ideas have shaped both research and practice in higher education and that's why this uh, introduction is uh, titled uh, a practical theory because LCT offers a sophisticated and at times quite complex theory for research, but it also has highly practical outcomes for education, ones which empower teachers and students by giving them the tools to understand and shape their own practices. So I'll introduce some, uh, some concepts and as I say, I'll hand over to Helen and then Lee will be much more practical. So for example, just to whet your appetite, for example, Lee's gonna be discussing RCT is becoming the professional knowledge of the next generation of teachers in South Africa. Uh, 28,000 almost have learned LCT this year alone. So that's um, pretty exciting. Okay, so what is LCT? Um, and for those of you who know this already, you can sing along with me. But um, for those who are, are new to LCT, I will be introducing it without uh, assuming no knowledge whatsoever. LCT is a uh, framework uh, that's built from and for empirical research. And as I've said, it enables us both to analyze and to shape practice. And it's used to explore all kinds of uh, institutional sites, all kinds of practices, um, all kinds of subject areas, as well as fields well beyond education, in fact, uh, things like the law, uh, museums, climate change denial online, things like that. And it's now an international and multidisciplinary community of scholars and educators, which means there are lots of, there's an increasing uh, volume of resources that you can draw on should you be 
interested after today. Um, there are books like Knowledge and Knowers and Knowledge Building, which keys, uh, sets out some keys on how to use them. There's a book series of which Building Knowledge in Higher Education is uh, particularly relevant to um, uh, Sherry, or Sherry, I think it was said, rather than Cherry. Um, but also accessing academic discourse for those who are interested in linguistics and very soon coming out, um, turning access into success um, by Sharon Clarence. There are online uh, seminars every two weeks and regularly uh, meeting of many LCT groups around the world, um, particularly things like the BITS Research Group in South Africa, which is extremely active and led by Lee Rushniak, who you'll be hearing from soon. It's a very friendly community and you can engage with others through an email forum and on social media and just about every paper is available for download from the website. Now, as I said, LCT is not confined to education. It's not confined to a particular level of education or discipline or national context. Um, it's not limited to one level of analysis. So concepts are not locked on to by a, a, a re, at least by definition, they're not locked on to uh, a specific level of analysis. You can use them to analyze the whole education system or go right down to individual words in a text. Uh, so there's a lot of flexibility. Um, it's also used alongside uh, other theories, other models, including um, very much used alongside systemic functional linguistics and with all sorts of methods, so qualitative, quantitative, um, so just because I used to look at something or used yet with a particular method or alongside another theory, that doesn't mean it can't be, it just means it hasn't been tried yet. And lastly, it's being used to not only analyse practices, but as I said already, to shape them as well. So today we're going to discuss studies that are, uh, and interventions, as it were, or practices that are using one part of the framework called semantics. Um, and these concepts are used to analyze all sorts of things in research from text to classrooms to assessments and so on, but they are also used to, as we'll see, to design curriculum, to shape pedagogy, to train teachers, teach students how to succeed, and all sorts of other practices. So it's very much a practical theory. But what's it for and why should we bother it? People come to LCT for all sorts of reasons. Um, is my hat but one it's ability to see knowledge practices in education sorry bear with me a second i am marvelous the internet is unstable i'm just moving over to bot so i'll just this for a second as i negotiate shifting off my rubbish wi-fi right i am back sorry about that anyway so um it enables us to see knowledge practices so in education our thinking about knowledge has been dominated for some time by two main big ways of thinking so one psychological and uses the word knowledge to mean what goes on in our minds and this usually focuses on cognitive sometimes effective but usually cognitive processes such as the ways of thinking or the conceptions or misconceptions of students and it leads research to explore generic processes of learning where what's being learned is not normally part of the picture Another um, influence is sociological and sees knowledge as a reflection of power or dominant interests. And the focus then is on the experiences of uh, people as categories or kinds of knowers, such as their social class, their race or their gender. And studies tend to ask whose knowledge is this or who is in the text or who is in the classroom and what the knowledge might be uh, and what's being taught and learned is again backgrounded. So in education, we tend to focus on ways of knowing or kinds of knowers when we talk about knowledge. Now, of course, both of those are extremely important, but if that's all that we look at, then we miss knowledge as an object in itself, one, one that takes different forms, forms which can influence how it's taught, forms which can influence who can learn it more easily or not, how they learn it better or not, and so on. 
So one context to LCT is that it sees knowledge as an object of study. Another is that when it does so, it doesn't use types. So there's a huge number of typologies out there, pure applied, hard soft, and lots of others. Um, and none of them work very well in empirical research. Not when you actually use them in close, detailed empirical research. Take something like a classroom, incredibly fluid, incredibly complex. No, uh, nothing in empirical data tends to fit neatly into these categories. And there's no real good way of conceptualizing shifts from one category or one type to another. And instead of that, when LCT sees knowledge, it reveals the organizing principles underlying knowledge practices in ways that get to grips with that fluidity and that complexity. How? Well, I'll introduce one part of the framework. Um, LCT has uh, several dimensions, which are uh, the name we give to sets of concepts that explore different aspects of practice. Uh, today, we're going to focus on semantics, uh, which is centered on two key concepts. There's a bunch of others, but these are the two key ones that we, uh, you need to know, semantic gravity and semantic density. And I'll just define those concepts and then discuss, uh, discuss um, a couple of other concepts that you'll need to follow along with the, uh, the far more interesting talks that are going to be following me um, and then get out of the way. So the first one of those concepts is semantic gravity, which describes the degree of context dependence of meaning, whether that meaning's in a curriculum or a textbook or a student essay or it's being spoken aloud, um, whatever it might be. And when something is strongly dependent on its context to make sense, uh, it has stronger semantic gravity. And when it's less dependent on its context, it exhibits weaker semantic gravity. So for example, if I say this cup and I'm pointing, uh, that's pretty uh, strongly context dependent to being here or at least seeing this video um, to know what cup I'm talking about. I'm just bringing my lovely border collie cup into the picture. Um, but if we take things like, um, I don't know, the, the meaning of a particular plant in biology that has stronger semantic gravity than the meaning of a species of plant or, or even more so uh, um, that's stronger uh, in turn than a process like photosynthesis that's much more general. Or in history, um, the meaning of a specific event like um, uh, the October 1917 Russian Revolution that embodies stronger uh, semantic gravity than the notion of revolutions or in turn even uh, weaker semantic gravity is uh, something like historical causation and things like that. So we see a continuum of strength. So we've got infinite capacity for, grid, uh, for gradation. We can, um, we can infinitely uh, slice this up if we wish to. We're not locked into static binaries like concrete and abstract, which are uh, very morally charged, um, depending upon what build you're in. Concrete might be valorized and abstract seen as ivory tower, or abstract might be valorized. Um, and concrete seen as of, of little importance. Often they're very much charged, then they're also very binary um, and uh, not much capacity to really get at the movements between them. And also I have no clue what people are talking about half the time when they say abstract, because it kind of combines this notion of context dependence with our next one, uh, next concept, which is complexity. But anyway, we can describe using semantic gravity uh, movements, so like weakening semantic gravity, such so as moving from particular cases up to generalizations and theories that cover a much wider range of contexts. And we can describe strengthening of semantic gravity, such as moving from a theory down to a, to a particular specific instance or example. Now that's one concept. The second key concept is semantic density, which is uh, the degree of complexity of practices Again, whether it's symbols or concepts or phrases or gestures or uh, clothing or body movement or musical sounds. In other words, it describes how much meaning is condensed or packed into something. The stronger semantic gravity is, the more meanings are condensed within that thing. Uh, the weaker it is, the fewer meanings are condensed. So an example I've, um, I often use uh, when introducing this is a term like gold and in everyday meanings, uh, Epistemologically, anyway, it condenses a limited number of meanings. It's a bright yellow, shiny, malleable metal used in coins, jewelry, dentistry, and electronics. But in the constellation, as we call it in LCT, of chemistry, of academic chemistry, in that complex constellation of meanings 
that is that academic discipline, it's embedded, that word is embedded in a complex set of meanings um, like uh, its atomic number, its atomic weight, its electron configuration and lattice structure and so on and so on, many, many others. And, and they in turn are parts of complex um, clusters and constellations of meaning, compositional structures, taxonomic structures, explore, explanatory processes, uh, some of which I've just highlighted on that slide. So in chemistry, gold has a lot of relations to other meanings, which is one way of understanding semantic, den uh, semantic density. Or another way of understanding two sort of mental images here is there's a lot condensed in it. So it has very strong semantic density. So again, we can also talk about strengthening, taking a range of meanings, packing them into a term or a concept or a symbol or even a gesture. Uh, for example, in uh, history, taking places and periods and customs and so on and so on and so on and, and packaging all that up into something like, say, the Middle Ages or the Renaissance or in biology, taking like cells and proteins and pigments and so on and, and putting those together into a constellation describing the process of photosynthesis. But we can also talk about weakening semantic density, which is unpacking meaning, such as taking a, a very technical term um, that's uh, very condensed and unpacking some of its meanings in simpler form. And that reduces the number of meanings to those given in the explanation or the unpacking. Right, so there, the two key concepts at the heart of semantics. And they can be used to explore practices in a kind of a range of ways. We have con other concepts that allow us to analyze semantic gravity and semantic density separately, right down to the level of individual words. And we're automating one of those tools through machine learning so that we can do that fine grained analysis at scale. We also have different ways of seeing how they change. Uh, and different ways of picturing this and different ways of analyzing this. And I'm going to introduce one simple way uh, because it's uh, relevant uh, uh, to the, the work that uh, Helen and Lee's going, uh, going to be talking about. And that's semantic profiling and semantic ranging uh, to coin a term. So um, that's where semantic profiling is where we, we chart uh, semantic gravity from um, more context dependent at the bottom to less context dependent at the top and semantic density uh, simpler at the bottom to more complex at the top. And then we look at a change over time. So we look at, say, it could be, this is tracing a semantic profile, uh, such as the unfolding of a text or classroom. Uh, and it could be different for semantic gravity. So this could be semantic gravity's profile over time and semantic density might be completely different. Or sometimes we get it so that they are um, either for simplicity or, or, or they're really close and they are moving inversely, and then we just trace one profile. So I just need to introduce you to a couple more ideas that you'll need uh, for today's uh, uh, wonderful talks. First is the names for a couple of profiles. This is a high flat line because it's high and a flat line. This is a low flat line. I'll just have a sip of my tea while you're taking that difficult word idea. This is a wave. It doesn't have to start and end at the top. It can start and end anywhere, uh, as long as it's moving up and down, or down and up. And the last idea you need today is semantic range, which is how far practices extend from concrete or simpler meanings to abstract or complex meanings. So the slide shows that waves have a greater range than flat lines. And sometimes we use just semantic range on its own. So as Helen's going to discuss, we can show that different tasks might require different semantic ranges. Here, the blue might be a specific assessment, or it could be an entire year of, of uh, study. And students might fail if they, uh, they cannot reach high enough uh, into, say, theory, like the first red arrow, or indeed reach up too high into too much theory, like the second red. Now, more and more research of schooling, of higher education, of teaching, assessment, student work, and more are using these ideas. And these studies are showing that flat lines are a problem and semantic waves are a key to building knowledge. And that's why these ideas, uh, I've introduced them, and that's why we're going to be talking about them. And they're also making clear that teaching students uh, how to uh, expand their semantic range, how to climb uh, a bigger semantic range, and how to surf uh, semantic waves is a social justice issue. So for example, in, a, in terms of research, education offers often a low flat line of empirical descriptions. You'll have all heard talks 
which are just descriptions of a specific classroom at a particular time or whatever it might be, never reaches beyond that very specific context. A high flat line, which I'm very closely, dangerously close to being at the moment, which is a freely floating theory, engaging little with empirical data, uh, limited uh, semantic um, ranges to them. And LCT research has shown that actually, if you want to build cumulatively over time, you need semantic waves, that concepts that translate down into empirical data, empirical data that's uh, uh, analyzed up into highly abstract ideas and move to another context and so on. So they may have a much greater range. And we see the same thing in successful writing. This is pro, this portrays two essays, one high achieving, one low achieving from uh, a study uh, from a few, quite a few years ago now, but it was a secondary school English unit taken by all students in New South Wales. They had to analyze three texts in relation to an abstract literary idea and the high achieving essay did a series of waves um, that went through the, the, you know, connected up and weaved together the concrete particularities of each text and these abstract literary ideas. And the low achieving essay just bumbled along the bottom describing things and giving personal responses and, and not even um, uh, connecting up very well between the texts. So there's loads of studies that are showing that um, students need to wave between personal and academic knowledge and between examples and theory and between concrete and abstract ideas, but not everyone can do this. So using, um, because basically, because uh, they come, students come with um, different capacities to reach up and down a semantic range and with different abilities to be able to recognize the kind of profiles or waves that are required. LCT doesn't have enough studies of this yet, but there is a quite a few decades of research um, using Bourdieu and Bernstein and educational linguistics that show that moving, that can be understood as showing that moving up and down um, more and more and more and being able to wave more and more are very much associated with some uh, socialization practices of some social groups and less so with others. So the students come with different capacities to, to wave and to reach higher or, or lower. Um, so being able to teach students how to do this is extraordinarily important. And that would make, that's what makes the LCT so exciting because we can not only analyze data in research using these concepts, uh, we can also teach those very same uh, tools to teachers and students. We can empower them to figure out for themselves what semantic range they need and how to wave in their teaching or in their assessments. And that's being done in all kinds of ways as I've showed on the slide and Helen and Lee are gonna provide some amazing examples of this kind of work. Um, which is really, really powerful work. So just to finish off then and to um, um, get on with it, uh, LCT is very practical theory. We can use it, as I've said over and over again, for research and for teaching and for shaping practices. And what I think is really important about that is it doesn't involve telling people what to do. I mean, we do have a better and better idea of what kinds of practices like semantic waving and weaving, and there's other things like autonomy tools, what kind of things work. But even more important than that is to empower people to be able to figure it out for themselves. So for example, the slide shows Vicky Ariza from Mexico and she's run a massive online course in, uh, in Mexico that helps students how to uh, learn how to succeed at university by teaching them semantic waving. 56,000 pre-university students in Mexico have already learned about that this year alone. And that enable, that gives students tools to be able to themselves analyze what they need to do in an essay and how to achieve it. So it makes the rules of the game visible and not just as a bag of ticks, tri uh, tricks and tips, but in terms of the underlying principles of success. And that's powerful theory in action. And to see what I mean, I'll now hand you over to Helen, who can show you in action rather than in the abstract as I've been doing. Thanks so much, Carl. Um... I will just uh, share my screen now. And that was an um, excellent introduction. Thanks so much. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, communicating complexity. So I'll give you one um, example that looks at, you know, what we've done in one subject, but hopefully you can sort of see how that um, has utility beyond that context. So I'll be looking at communicating complexity. So Communicating complex ideas is central in higher education. We need to be able to do it in our research, in our teaching, 
and of course uh, in outreach as well. So there is quite a bit of advice around how to communicate complex ideas effectively. So think elevator pitches. Uh, we're told, you know, to know your audience, to use familiar ideas or analogies, to leave stuff out, to use the right language. And sometimes this advice is enough, it makes sense. But other times, and maybe most of the time, successful communication of complex ideas is actually pretty difficult to pull off. And really that's because these sorts of guidelines aren't teaching us how to communicate complex ideas effectively. There's an assumption that we know quite a bit already, how to judge what's familiar, what's okay to leave out. In our case, because we're considering learners, we can't take these things for granted. We have to be precise. Um, but this precision, I think, is important more broadly as well. So in the work I'll be presenting today, I'll offer a different approach to this communication challenge. Rather, th rather than considering um, communication as separate to the discipline, um, so something that can be captured as uh, generic guidelines, I'll be demonstrating how LCT can be used to conceptualise communication from within the discipline. So effectively, I'll show how it can be used to first see complexity within the discipline and then argue how this vision um, is able to help facilitate more effective communication. So the talk draws from research conducted as part of an um, Australian uh, government funded discovery project, um, which looked at the construction of digital resources as um, assessments in higher education. So these are generally uh, multimodal explanations that you can think of as like short videos. Um, so these kinds of assessments are becoming more common as the tools for media creation become more accessible. Um, in addition to sort of developing students' communication skills, these products have also been shown to improve engagement, to foster creativity, and also to encourage um, deep understanding of the content area. So think that, um, you know, kind of learning by teaching effect. The research um, showed us very quickly that um, the quality of these products was highly variable. Um, so despite, I was just checking the chat there just in case something was going wrong, but all good. Um, so despite the guidance being provided to the students, um, they actually struggled to apply this to, to their assessments. So LCT was used um, to diagnose these issues and then to help address them as well. Okay, so just a quick um, recap about um, semantics. So semantics is one dimension of um, LCT and includes semantic gravity and semantic density. So semantic gravity um, is a uh, represents the degree to which meanings relate to the context and semantic density um, reflects this degree of condensation of meaning. So sort of abstraction and complexity respectively. The analytical tool that I will be considering um, in this context is the semantic range. So this tells us um, the range of that complexity of any given practice or in any given context. So we can have a very narrow semantic density range that really only represents um, very complex um, ideas um, or practices or things. Um, and then we can have a narrow semantic density range that actually only represents you know, very um, simple or less complex um, ideas or things. And then we've got you know, these sort of um, ranges in between. Now, I know that I um, titled this you know, communicating uh, complex ideas, but actually I did also mean um, within this that we're considering like abstraction as a form of complexity, but these are two, um, are two different things. So both of um, 
the idea of these ranges apply to both semantic density and semantic gravity um, in that larger ranges represent um, a larger variety of those um, of those things. So as Carl mentioned, um, these ranges or the idea of these ranges, um, they've been shown to be important for understanding um, a range of different practices and particularly in science education, they've been important for understanding explanations. So I'd like to just present two examples of how we've understood something about explanations in science in this research. Okay, so this is how um, we used LCT to first diagnose. So in this first example, um, we are considering the resources that were made in a senior pharmacology subject. So these digital resources, these digital explanations. Um, the students were required first in this subject to develop a literature review and then actually repurpose this literature review into one of these digital products. Um, so the purpose of the task, um, it, intended, it was intended to help students develop their ability to communicate complex ideas to a non-specialist audience. So really what this represents in terms of, you know, what the aim was um, to, um, sorry, I just had a notification come up. Um, what this represents in terms of the aim of the assessment is to have a relatively large semantic range. So one that includes ideas that represent that weaker um, semantic density, but still actually reaching up to, um, you know, a stronger semantic density as well. However, what we saw instead was that students were not actually able to consistently judge what non-specialist meant in terms of the non-specialist audience. So the semantic range across the different products varied quite a bit. Um, in this product, you can see that we noticed there was a very narrow semantic range, and that was one that exhibited a stronger semantic density. So it was too complex. And you can see that just in this um, excerpt over here. Okay, so in this next example, this was from the pre-service teacher cohort. So the students in this case were asked to explain a scientific concept to a school-aged audience. Um, so this was a task that intended to develop both their pedagogical and their content knowledge. Um, so the students needed to demonstrate an understanding of the concept and also make sure that it was accessible to children in this digital product. So um, this corresponds to probably a more narrow semantic range than the previous example. Um, so, you know, the, the explanation needed to be um, relatively straightforward, so um, relatively simple, but it did actually need to go up a little bit to include um, something complex enough to warrant it being a scientific understanding. So it needed to, you know, include that science. What we saw across the sample was difficulty in extending that semantic range up from that, um, you know, very uh, sort, of, sort of narrow semantic range here in the weaker semantic density area. So the students were not identifying that relevant scientific concept in the explanations. They say very every day, um, so much so that in fact, some of them, you know, they could have been products created for other subjects. Um, so they weren't um, immediately identifiable as, you know, a science product. So I suppose like in some way, it seems that these issues are fairly trivial. So like for the pharmacology student, you'd say, okay, well, it's complex, make it a bit simpler. And for the pre-service teacher, you can kind of say, all right, well, emphasize the science, like what's the scientific concept? Um, but these weren't oversights, like the students did in fact believe that they were addressing the assessment criteria. Um, and sort of in the interviews that we conducted as part of the research, it was clear that there wasn't a shared understanding of these expectations. So what, you know, what these things actually meant. So in the following example, what I'm going to do is elaborate on how LCT was used um, to make these expectations more explicit. 
So I'm going to be drawing on the pre-service teacher task. Um, so this was a multimodal scientific explanation. So a short video explaining some scientific concept. And the aim of it was to help the student develop that scientific knowledge. So to learn about the science and then also to be able to restructure it, um, recontextualize it for different audiences, so different ages. Um, so the aim was to make a correct judgment in terms of the semantic range of that explanation. So we introduced three changes in order to help achieve this. Um, so the first was to actually provide the semantic range within the question. So this relates more to semantic um, gravity um, in identifying that there is a much more abstract concept that underlies this everyday thing that's happening. So for example, we'd phrase it as explain X using this particular concept. Um, the second thing we did was introduce a formative assessment task that required students to actually make judgments around the semantic density and the semantic gravity of the explanations that were um, intended for different groups. So to really um, think about those characteristics of the knowledge um, for the different um, audiences. And then we had, of course, the rubric um, targeting those specific outcomes so that the students understood what our expectations were. So um, I just want to give you one example and hopefully you'll sort of get a picture of what this um, all looked like in practice um, just with this example. Because um, obviously, you know, it's uh, the explanations themselves were quite long and there was a lot to it. Um, but I think, you know, this should give you a good idea of how, um, how semantic density and gravity um, were used in the semantic range specifically. So um, this, what I'm going to tell you about is the formative task that we used as part of this assessment to get students to think about um, the complexity and the abstraction of their explanations, um, specifically those that were um, constructed for different audiences. Um, so this particular example was looking at why coral is considered an animal and so um, in the formative task, we asked the students to think about how many ideas were present um, and how many should stay for each of the adaptations for the different audiences. In terms of the semantic gravity, so in terms of the abstraction, we asked them how abstract are the concepts that um, are, are used and which of these should we consider um, for the different audiences and why. Okay, so I just wanted to sort of give you an idea of what this, um, what one of these explanations um, look like. And this is not, um, certainly not the whole explanation, but um, hopefully it sort of gives you an idea of um, the different ideas that can be discussed um, when answering this, this question. And, you know, the main idea behind this um, question is that, you know, coral actually does look like a plant. Um, so, it um, you know looks more like a plant than it does an animal, but it is actually classified as an animal um, because they've obviously got the characteristics that um, mean that they belong to the animal kingdom. But there are a range of um, a number of other ideas that can be discussed when answering this question. So um, talk about how they live, that they live in colonies, they're made of individual polyps, they create this, they secrete this thing. Um, that creates this hard exoskeleton um, of calcium carbonate. Um, they have this specific way of eating the um, marine life. So they, you know, sort of flick this um, cell out and it, you know, drags this, these other organisms in. Um, and they interestingly live in this symbiotic relationship with algae um, to gain their energy and oxygen. So these are the um, products of photosynthesis, so algae um, photosynthesizes, and they use that um, to live, but they don't, the coral, don't photosynthesize themselves because of course um, they're animals. So um, if we sort of think about, um, you know, the students sort of completing this formative task, they're having to think about which of those ideas and how many of those ideas they should include 
for explanations that were targeted for a particular audience. So in this case, um, the students were asked to think about a, what we call a universal explanation. So that's sort of like that there's this understanding that anything that's communicated in things like, um, you know, newspapers or, um, you know, uh, kind of uh, popular sort of communication of science is aimed at like a year nine to 10 um, level of science understanding. Um, so this was the explanation they constructed first. And in that explanation, you know, you could identify a range of these different um, ideas. Um, and that's got a, you know, relatively large semantic density range, um, but obviously not, you could go further, that's the idea, and you could obviously go um, narrower as well. So these are some of the ideas. And then because this was a multimodal task, we asked them to think about the um, images, the representations that were used as well. So these were the kinds of representations they, they provided. And then uh, we asked them to think about, well, how many of those ideas would you still discuss if you were um, uh, repackaging this for a kindergarten audience? And so, um, you know, this, I know that it sounds like a very straightforward thing to do, but it is actually it just really, really tricky to, um, to get right. And in uh, sort of priming the students to think about exactly, you know, how many ideas, how complex those ideas were, um, and empowering them to actually um, focus on a small number of those very important ideas, uh, this was able to get them to, uh, to really make that uh, explanation more appropriate to that audience. So um, they would discuss the classification and rather than kind of talking about all the um, kingdoms and all of that, they would simply say, you know, they would eat, they don't make their own food and they would, you know, look in a particular way. And you can see here that the pictures, um, the representations that are used are different um, as well. So um, this, I, I guess what I wanted to say sort of at this point was that, um, of course, there was a lot more to, to this story. So, um, you know, you can think about what happens to build explanations up within a particular semantic range. And we did also think about the structure of the explanation and we thought about the language used and we thought about the representations used as well. Um, so in the research um, group, um, it was a collaboration between linguists and science education um, researchers. So um, I did want to acknowledge that a lot more kind of um, went on, but I hope that what I have been able to do um, today is, you know, I guess the first thing is to emphasize that uh, we can um, take a lot for granted when we're looking at communication and, and in fact, when we're looking at assessment. And I hope I was able to show how a concept like, um, you know, the semantic range can be really helpful and really powerful um, in making, you know, these sorts of things more um, explicit and, you know, understanding how best to, com um, to communicate complex ideas, um, which, is, um, which is me. So thank you um, so much for listening and I will pass over to um, Lee now and we will have uh, an opportunity for questions at the at the end as well. Lee, are you there? Thank you. Yes, I am. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, so I'm going to talk about how the pandemic led to a crisis and also an opportunity for us to th rethink uh, work-based learning in teacher education in South Africa and how we used um, LCT to do this. So um, Carl has started the semantic wave and introduced theory and 
unpacked it and made it a little bit easier to understand and so on. And now I'm going to come at the bottom of the wave. I'm going to focus this talk on three parts. The first, um, I'm looking at the context of what we're doing in work-based learning in teacher education and some of the concerns that research has shown um, in terms of what's working and what's going wrong with work-based uh, learning. Then I move a little bit up in terms of conceptualizing an intervention that, um, oh, sorry, um, uh, conceptualizing an intervention which led to a massive online course. And then I land up right at the top looking at the contribution of um, this whole endeavor. So all practices, professional programs have periods of work-based learning attached to developing expertise in novices. And in these um, work-based learning, they're expected to take their formal learning, they're supposed to apply it in some kind of real authentic context. But there's also a sense that in the work-based learning, um, they must be embodied in a practice and they pick up from practicing um, experts, um, in this case, teachers, um, the real nitty gritty of what it means to, to participate in that practice. And um, so every year, um, universities um, in South Africa, teacher education is in the higher education sector, place thousands and thousands and thousands of students um, in schools for uh, up to eight, eight to 10 weeks of the year. And they're supposed to be observing classroom practice. They're supposed to plan and teach their lessons. They're supposed to reflect on their classroom experience. Um, they have an opportunity to engage with teachers and get feedback from the teachers. And they're supposed to demonstrate their in growing teaching competence for assessment, um, which is all very well until um, the COVID hit. And in March, it became very, very clear that with schools in hard lockdown in South Africa for several months, and who knows what was going to happen after that, there would be thousands of student teachers who would not be able to complete the work-based um, component of their teacher education um, qualification. And um, the sector was plunged into a crisis. What do we do with these many, many thousands of students who have to do a, a practice-based session in the school, especially the final year students who um, are so close to qualification. And if they didn't get something, they would not be able to graduate. Um, so up until three weeks ago, our schools were not in a position to accept students at all. Uh, three weeks ago with our drop down to the lowest level of lockdown, which is level one in South Africa, um, we are now in a position that we are allowed to send final year students into the schools for half the time that is required by legislation. So this really gave um, teacher education around the country quite a headache. And so there was a um, national collaboration um, where teacher educators from around the country came together um, and we put our minds to this co complex um, context and um, how, would, how would we be able, how would, um, how would we be able to address this issue in a way that led to authentic worthwhile learning, but not in school-based placements? And I led a team of um, teacher educators from around the country, and we worked with the um, departments of education. We worked with the teaching, uh, the teacher professional um, council, which is SACE, and Jet Education Services, an NGO, 
to think about how could we address this crisis, but not just address us as an interim um, contingency plan, but actually how could we use it to think about what's working and what's not working in, in work-based learning and how could we do it in a way that works better, that builds a system that addresses some of the shortcomings. And so we turn to the research about teaching practice. Um, and I just want to touch on a few studies. Um, in South Africa, um, all too well, it's been documented that when students go into the schools, there's high absenteeism by teachers. And um, a lot of the time, the students simply get left to their own devices, figuring it out um, as they go along. Um, there's a tendency for lesson planning to be regarded not as an opportunity to embody the kind of the professional thinking of practice, but rather the kind of the admin work. So um, lesson planning is not considered to be a, a careful process of professional thinking. It's kind of the paperwork that you fill in to show that you've taught a lesson. And that, again, just makes it as an admin task rather than really developing expertise. Um, in a national project that Carol uh, Bertram and I were involved in several years ago, we analyzed assessment tools and many of them promote a technical compliance. So for example, they would be set up like, did the student use a resource? Did the student um, do group work? Did the student write a word on the chalkboard? And it became a checklist of yes, they did, no, they didn't, regardless of what was suitable for that knowledge in that context. And so um, the assessments were set up to promote technical compliance. The two, um, the, the two um, studies that I'm wanting to elaborate on are both used LCT concepts to show other things about what was not um, working in practice. The one I'm going to talk about is uh, descriptive accounts of classroom events rather than deep reflection and analysis. And another one looked at teacher tips and that's Borello's study. So I'm going to then just look at those two and how LCT helped us to see what was not working um, in practice. So here's a genuine um, extract from a student's um, reflective journal. And um, if you think about the, 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 the semantic uh, profile, um, there was very little sense of thinking about what was working and why it was working in this lesson. You know, teaching in every timetable slot is demanding, it's good experience. The supervising teacher was not at school. At first I was happy, but I, was, I had challenges. Doesn't explain what the challenges are, doesn't explain why those challenges happened, doesn't think about, I could have done this, I could have done that, but I chose to handle those challenges in, in certain ways. And so it's a very, very um, superficial description of um, a couple of classroom events. He goes on to talk about repeating a lesson that he taught before and how much easier it is to manage a class if you're confident with the content knowledge. Okay, so now at that point, he's making a link between managing a class and having good content knowledge, and he's making a connection between those two concepts. So for that, there's a little bit of a strengthening of semantic density. In other words, making it a little bit more complex. So um, generally, the, this particular student's uh, reflections were anything but. And um, it was really a low semantic flat line, um, which really didn't add any kind of value in terms of 
his development of professional thinking in the practice and in the context of the classroom. So let's, yeah, that, 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 that was how um, LCT helped us to analyze what was going on in their reflections. And about 30% of our students, um, instead of really deeply reflecting on their practice, gave these kind of low semantic flatline descriptive accounts of classroom events. Well, maybe the teacher feedback might um, get that semantic range going. Um, unfortunately not. So uh, Borello did a, a study of um, a number of teachers who had, who had been in a mentorship program um, at a very affluent school. And this mentorship program was considered a flagship um, program in their school that had been running for 10 years. And she analyzed the actual discussion that followed a teacher observation of student lessons and what kind of feedback the teacher had been given to the students. And in this particular, after this particular lesson, one of the teachers really, uh, his feedback was in three parts. So the first part, all spoke about the fact that the green pen on the whiteboard was difficult to read, okay? Which might be a very useful tip, but it doesn't really open up the thinking that one needs for um, professional practice and, and putting together a valuable learning experience. And the next part of the feedback was about the fact that the kids were a little bit confused at the beginning and he advised her to, um, to, to inform them about what they're going to do at the, at the start. So there's a connection between um, kind of signaling your intention and the students and their confusion and so on and being clear. So again, we have a little bit of a strengthening of semantic density there. And then he goes on to the smart use was better because why? Because your writing was nice and big. So although there had been mentoring, although there had been a formal um, observation of a lesson and the teacher gave feedback, really, what are the take homes of this particular um, mentoring interaction? Don't use a green pen tell them the topic at the beginning of the lesson and write nice and big on the smart board. And maybe those are all very useful tips, but it really doesn't give novices access to the principles of um, pedagogical decisions that you need to make a worthwhile learning experience in the lessons you teach. So this is where then the group of teacher educators and I um, put our minds together and we thought, well, one of the things that really makes it difficult to learn to teach is because you think that because you've been in a classroom for 15 years, 12 years, whatever it is, that you know what's going on. You understand the routines and Actually, all you need is the certificate because you already know how to teach. Because why? Because you've been watching teachers for many, many years. And so it's easy to see the routines and the classroom management and the interactions between teachers and learners. It's very, very much more difficult to see how teachers work with knowledge. And it's also very much more difficult to see the basis on which judgments are made, decisions are made. And we thought that here during the lockdown period, we can't put them in schools, but maybe we could make a course to help them see the complexity of decision-making and that it's not okay just to have um, random, unconnected, disconnected um, information thrown at children and think that that is knowledge. 
and simply taking a whole lot of different activities around a topic and putting them side by side in a lesson doesn't necessarily lead to worthwhile learning. So we conceptualized this course around the kind of the, the teacher thinking that one needs to do in order to make appropriate decisions. Not just having a rule for a, a rule of thumb for oh always do this or always do that, a tip for teachers, but really a deep consideration of who you are as a teacher, what it is you teach, the knowledge, who it is you teach. So the learners and where you teach, the contextual possibilities and how these are all um, important in deciding how it is that you, you teach. And so we developed a course and it was an emergence in response to this complex context that we found ourselves in, in the middle of the COVID pandemic. Um, it was an online practice focused module, which has a very different logic to the normal um, university based course works, uh, each of them that um, works with a systematized body of, of, of knowledge. This really took as its starting point, um, the practice. And it got very quickly recognized by government and the professional council. And they then issued communicate to all universities that this course would be regarded as a four week equivalent of a school based placement. And so we couldn't put the students in the schools, so they couldn't do the learning in practice. So this course instead took the focus of learning from practice. Um, it looked at all the, the, the key choices that every teacher has to make in relation to every lesson that they teach, regardless of the subject, regardless of um, the level at which they are teaching, regardless of the context in which they're teaching. And I'm going to give you an illustration of one part of that course just now. It opened up the options, you know, the teachers could do this and this and this, um, possibly beyond the, the recipe that some um, students had learned along the way. And then we looked at decisions made by real teachers across a wide range of contexts so that the students would be able to see which choices were made by different teachers when, where, and how, what choices are appropriate when, and not all choices are appropriate in every context. So there's a sense of judgment here. And so we called the module Teacher Choices in Action to, um, to really focus on the idea that we are looking at the, the less visible ways in which teachers make decisions um, in terms of their, the lessons that they teach. Um, the course went, it, it was launched in August um, 2020. And up until now, we've had 24 of the universities offering teacher education uh, participating. Others will come on board um, next year. And so far, there've been nearly just 30 students shy of 28,000 who have done this module as part of their work-based learning. And I do need to just acknowledge that the module was made possible by a capacity improvement program um, that was funded by the Department of Higher Education and Training and the um, European Union. So the Teacher Choices in Action module was developed across six um, units. And what I've done is I've shown with a red asterisk the ones in which we implicitly use concepts from LCT 
different dimensions of LCT to develop student teachers as thinking knowers who think in specialist ways and, and who need to understand what those specialist ways of thinking are in terms of their classroom practice. Um, and what I'm going to do is, is look specifically at one part, which is um, the choices around how to sequence knowledge and how that worked with semantics and semantic ranges. I want to just talk very briefly about the logo. You'll see the triangle there. Um, and we, we limited our focus on how the teacher works with knowledge. You'll see the teacher is at the top. The knowledge is represented by the book and how the teacher works with learners and how then the teacher sets up conditions of possibility for the learners to work with that knowledge. And so as we went through the different units, so we highlighted different parts of the logo um, in terms of what, what part of this three-way relationship between teachers, learners, and knowledge we were working with. So in terms of unit three, the teacher choices that work with knowledge, we are looking very strongly at the teacher and the relationship with the knowledge. And that's why those two parts of the triangle are highlighted. And we taught, uh, we used semantic waves explicitly to teach the students about sequencing their lesson steps. Because like I said before, just a random collection of activities doesn't necessarily take students to learning. Students are often taught a maxim, um, start with what the children no. Okay, and that's a great starting point sometimes, not always, but sometimes it is. But then what? And what semantic waves did was give us this, um, this, the, this way of thinking about if you begin with experience or examples, carefully chosen examples, then what? Then you look for patterns and you start with the upward shift. Then you need to impose some kind of conceptual order where you're at the high part of the semantic wave and then take those concepts into other contexts where you're going downwards again. And so the semantic wave starts low, goes high and goes down again. And there's a systematized logic. There's an, a, a logic of practice in the way one sequences lesson steps, using those four parts, the low, the high, the upward and the downward part of the semantic wave. But that's of course not the only shape of semantic wave that is useful. So we've spoken about another kind of semantic wave and this is another example, but this time beginning with a high concept and breaking down the complexity then looking at examples and building the complexity up again. Again, you're still working with high, low, upward and downward parts of the wave, but you're doing it in a different order. And the question then becomes, where do you start and what, where do you move from there into a coherent learning process? So one way that we used the semantic waves was actually to think about how we are designing um, the, the, the units, the six units. And I'm just giving you an example here, and I'm going to go through all those little slides a little bit uh, later. So don't, I know that you can't read them, um, but it's just an, as an illustrative thing. So we generally, does introduced a concept, introduced a key choice that um, teachers have to make. We unpacked that choice, looking at options, looking at the different 
um, ways in which one could have possibilities that perhaps the students hadn't thought of. We took them through a guided analysis of a, some sort of artifact of practice. Um, we then gave them opportunities to observe recorded lessons and analyze those lessons in terms of the concept and in terms of the choice that that teacher had made in relation to that knowledge in that context. And then we took it upwards in terms of what does this mean for understanding the professional thinking that informs teaching practices. So there I've just used particular slides from unit three, the one on sequencing um, of knowledge with semantic waves. So we used the semantic waves to conceptualize the learning process as well as to actually teach them how to conceptualize a learning process. The guided example for ex that, that we, um, we used, and I, I know that you won't be able to see this, this was an actual WhatsApp conversation between a maths teacher and a grade eight learner at a school where the children do not have internet access at home. And the only way that the teacher could carry on with learning um, during the lockdown was through WhatsApp messages. And in this message, um, she takes the, ch the child from the question of, you have a shop, what do you wanna sell? I wanna sell ice cream, all the way to seeing the relationship between profit, income, and expenditure. And the students um, analyzed that WhatsApp conversation um, with the guided, the guided narration. And we showed them that that started with an everyday example of selling ice cream it built up to complex concepts using the example. It introduced the complex concepts. It then took them to another example. And then it built up complexity by asking the this learner to think about the relationship between profit, income, and expenditure. In other words, a perfect semantic wave with up parts, with down parts, with high parts, with low parts. And once we had shown them this, we then gave them an opportunity to observe a lesson that had been recorded in, in a school. And it was a grade 11 lesson on food labels. And there, um, again, they were able to look at the parts of the lesson and see how the teacher shifted knowledge between experience and examples in some part of the lessons and complex concepts in, the other, in others. And the teacher started looking at health problems caused by diets, looked at why it was need, necessary to bring in this thing on a food label called a guideline of daily amount. They then started to unpack which nutrients should have limited intake and would need to be on those labels. They then looked at an example, an actual tin of condensed milk and the labels. And then the teacher gave them a task with a text and questions where they put all this knowledge together. And what the students were asked to do was to identify the parts of the lesson, whether those parts of the lessons were up, downward, high or low parts of a semantic wave, and then see that actually there was a logic in the sequence of the lesson steps from the problem to the concept, to unpacking the concept, to an example, and then moving back up to complexity. And what that then gave them was access, not just to don't use the green pen and write big on the smart board, but a logic of the actual core 
business of classroom life, and that is um, making knowledge accessible to the children that you're teaching. And then the students were given a, um, a chance to go into a bank of, uh, of lessons. Um, I don't expect you to read that, but it's just an, one example. And to choose lessons that were relevant to their subject and to their level um, in the school system. And to observe those lessons and to analyze those lessons. And what we were trying to see then is whether the students were again just sticking to the visible parts of the lesson describing the routine and this happened then that happened then that happened or whether they were able to start drawing on concepts from the course to analyze not just the out the outer actions of the teacher but part of the knowledge building process. And um, this was a, an example of one of the, 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 the student participants, one out of the 28,000 who watched a lesson, a grade seven lesson on uh, peer pressure. And you can see that, you know, she started talking about the language being English, of course, South Africa um, having sometimes up to 10, 12, 15 languages in one class and and look there straight away the teacher used a semantic wave because she shifted the learning between general concepts and specific examples she drew on experience of the learners and so on and so immediately we see the students taking up these ideas and using them to talk about um, the lessons that they are observing, not in a school-based placement, but rather um, from the lesson library that we put online. And just finishing up, you know, where we took um, unit three to was um, then complexifying the high part of the semantic wave and looking at how cumulative learning um, needs not just one semantic wave in one lesson, but semantic waves over and over and over again throughout the schooling system um, in order to give st uh, students greater access to complex concepts um, as they move from the, the elementary parts of our schooling system right up to higher education. And how every teacher's work using semantic waves would give them access to higher and higher levels of complexity and abstraction, but never losing the touch to the experiential, the real ex life examples, the real world problems that give complex concepts their meaning. And the third part of the presentation is then really to really reflect on um, the contribution of this particular intervention. So for the teacher trainees themselves, they were able to um, complete their teaching practical requirements in spite of the pandemic. And we have many thousands of students who um, can now qualify um, because of the, the, um, the way that this course was able to compensate for half of the, their time in a school-based placement. And they learned a set of shared conceptual tools to analyze the decision-making in, in practice that took them well, well, well beyond the low semantic flatline and got them to start to understand practice um, in, in much more complex ways. For the teacher educators in South Africa, um, this was an opportunity for greater collaboration 
some of the studies have shown that one of the huge concerns is inconsistency across the sector, but in particular in terms of work-based learning. And now we have a national platform um, for bringing and conceptualizing work-based learning in a really rigorous way. And I've heard from a number of institutions already that they are changing some of their pedagogy courses in order to take what was done in this online um, course, take it further, and also to set the students up for this kind of learning and this kind of attention, not on the logistics and the technical aspects of teaching, but the conceptualizing and the professional thinking that goes into um, making quality learning experiences, not just keeping children busy while their parents are at work. To me, one of the most exciting parts of this whole project has been it opens up the, policy, the possibility for education, uh, teacher education research, which is grossly um, under-researched in South Africa, and I would say internationally too. And I think part of the problem of researching um, work-based learning is that you have very different student teachers going into very different contexts at different stages of their teacher education uh, programs. And there's, there's very little way that you can start to um, make general claims about this kind of context is always good for this kind of student because at different times of their professional development, the context, um, different contexts might, may, might restrict or empower them in different ways. So this is a large scale systematic course where students across the country were engaging in the same set of um, practice and artifacts of practice, but bringing with them the conceptual tools that they had learned at different points of their teacher training. And so another way that we're going to use LCT is not only to conceptualize the overall course and to find the gaps, but also to analyze the empirical data. And you saw Nocisi's, um, that was one of the, the, the sources of data is their um, lesson observation analysis reports. Um, so we, one of the things that we're going to do is look at how junior and senior teacher trainees um, respond to the same lesson. And we're wanting to see uh, differences in their semantic gravity, semantic density, um, in their lesson observations, and what it is that they are talking about and commenting on. If a first year student um, is, is, is analyzing practice in exactly the same way as a almost qualified student. You've got to ask what's going on in the teacher education program. So we think that this is a way of being able to understand how specialist ways of thinking and analyzing practice develops over time. And we can also use um, the semantics of LCT to investigate whether there is value in learning from practice as a compulsory component of work-based learning. Um, and how we would do this again is using the concepts of semantic gravity, semantic density to compare shifts um, between any particular student responses to artifacts of practice from the beginning of the module to the end. Hey, it's six o'clock. Thank you. <laughs> Last point is, yeah, uh, there's a work-based learning and we know that the, that the findings of the research will feed into that. And that is at the end. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Lee. Um, and we uh, do have a few comments um, uh, reflecting on how um, amazing that um, you know that design is and um, those possibilities are. And we do have a few questions that have um, appeared already. And um, although it's six o'clock, I did um, want to encourage um, a bit of discussion around this. And I would um, like to uh, kind of invite people to, to stick around um, to, to engage in that. Um, so I'm just gonna sort of um, scroll back a little bit. Uh, there's a question here from Karen um, just about uh, sort of the fundamentals of LCT. And so uh, maybe Carl's best to answer this question around how uh, the idea of cumulative- Actually, actually Helen, I'd say first, uh, just let anybody uh, unmute themselves and speak and just jump in with a question. Karen, did you want to um, start us off? Thanks very much from from South Africa, um, and not in the teaching in the in the um, the, the, the teaching space. I, I teach higher education, but in the um, health sciences space. So I'm very keen to move to to bring LCT into the the um, health sciences education space. Um, but I was just um, just really wondering how the the cumulative learning of the semantic waves. Um, Fills, whether it's equivalent to the concepts of scaffolding and spiraling um, or whether yeah, th there are differences. So 